there are lots of good reasons to start your own business. These three pictures indicate them. Freedom to do what you love, uh, security for you and your family, and nobody else is going to provide for your security except for you. Don't rely on a government to do it. Many of the world's governments are bankrupt or will become so. I'm not sure about here, but generally speaking, I would count on myself rather than on governments. And also opportunities. You, each and every one of you, has a unique set of skills, connections, knowledge, relationships, and these give you the potential to start a company that is absolutely unique and address a customer need that no one else can. So there are lots of good reasons to start your own business. We're going to find out how you can do that here today. Here's one of my favorite quotes from someone who sat in on this workshop at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Before now, startups always seemed so distant. I didn't know where to start. Now I realize I have all the resources I have. Each of you has everything you need right now to start your own business, believe it or not. There are only two things you need. Well, let me, uh, before I talk about that, let me talk a little bit about my own experience. In 2001, I was running my second company, Customer Sat, which I'd started in 1997. Our, we were planning on closing our second round of financing in the first quarter of 2001. The, the deal would not close. We had to close the deal if we were going to continue with the number of employees that we had at that time, which was about 50. Uh, we, I, I remember waking up at 2 in the morning often in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin, wondering if we were going to be able to close this deal and bring the company through the crisis of the dot-com bust. Well, the deal never closed, and in 90 days, I had to lay off half of my workforce, cut back salaries, first 10%, then 20%, factor receivables in order to make payroll and move to smaller, more modest offices upstairs in our building and rent out the downstairs to another company who eventually went out of business. Then we, with this lower expense rate, we finally uh, broke even in the third quarter and had the goal of being profitable in the fourth quarter. We achieved that. September 11th, 2001 happened in the third quarter. So instead of making a profit, we just broke even, but we got through. And the question, lots of our competitors and other companies in our industry failed. Why did they fail when we survived? Well, I, I, this shows the rest of it. Of we, over the next seven, eight years, we introduced some new technology, uh, action management. This company was doing uh, online surveys for large corporations. We signed up those corporations, our revenues grew, and then in 2008, we were acquired by another company. But I think the thing that differentiated us from other companies and our management team was passion. We really cared about what we were doing. Most of the company, 85, 90% of it, was owned by the employees. That's really important. Our competitors were substantially owned by outside investors. So our employees had a real interest in making this company survive. Uh, and so we went on and had a successful event. So if I were to say what are the most important things for starting a company, passion and perseverance. They go hand in hand. I'll explain that on the next slide. But when thinking about where to start a company, think about what you are passionate about. It could be a sport, family, work, hobby, activity, geographical area, world travel, video games, you name it, it doesn't matter what it is. Within that area that you're passionate about, there will be lots of customer needs that you can address. But that's where you should start in looking for those customer needs. So passion and perseverance help you break through obstacles like the ones I described. They also give you more curiosity and knowledge that let you recognize unaddressed customer needs sooner than others would. 
and so you can come out with new products and services that address those needs sooner. I, I, would, fair to, I would hazard to say that if you are not passionate about the area that you are starting your business in, its likelihood of success is not very high. So this is the most important thing. Uh, you're going to have to work long hours. You want to work in an area that you are enjoying. Passion and perseverance normally go together, but they don't have to. You can have one without the other. So if you have passion without perseverance, that's like a passing fancy. It's not going to last. If you have perseverance without passion, that's drudgery, right? You want to have both. And we, it goes by many names. One of the names is flow. The two reinforce each other. If you're passionate about something, uh, it'll be easy to be perseverant because the hours will go by very quickly. And then if you're perseverant about something, I, you stick with it, you eventually get better and better at it, so you develop a love for it, a passion for it. So the two are mutually uh, reinforcing. And if you can think of any aspect or moment in your life where you experience this reinforcement between passion and perseverance, chances are that's a good area to consider for starting a business, whatever it was. Incidentally, this reinforcement between passion and perseverance happens between many different attitudes. If you, uh, we tend to think that if we feel enthusiastically, if we feel enthusiastic, we will act enthusiastic. It's actually the opposite. Hi, hello. Uh, and so if the fact is, if you uh, act enthusiastically, you will become and feel enthusiastic. So uh, it's uh, similarly with these other things. So actions and attitudes form a positive feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And you can, th it is, it is uh, uh, contagious. So uh, if you act and feel a certain way, others will pick up on that. So you want to try to create these positive feedback loops am among all your stakeholders, fellow employees, suppliers, customers, uh, everyone in your social network, okay? These could be any of the things that you're, you're passionate about. You know better than I. So we're going to do a quick exercise right now. What is one thing you are passionate or perseverant about? Would someone be willing to share one thing they're passionate or perseverant about? Law. <laughs> Law. That's a great thing. Great. Good. There's lots of entrepreneurial opportunities there. Law is really transforming and becoming more self-service online to eliminate the cost of lawyers, so lots of opportunities there. Anybody else, something you're passionate or perseverant about? Yes, sir. Liberty. Liberty, absolutely. Oh, great. Uh, listen, and uh, just delighted, and you're, you have a publishing business around liberty, so it sounds like you're already doing what you're passionate about. Good stuff. Great. Okay. All right, so now let's move on to what it takes to start a company. There are only two things you need a customer need and an advantage for addressing that need, a need in an area that you're passionate about and an advantage applicable to satisfying that need. Okay, we're gonna talk about both of those. Think of it as trying to find the need <coughs> and the advantage for which uh, the size of the need and the strength of the advantage is maximized, okay? Now the advantage has two parts. It's your resources relative to those of others addressing the same need. Okay, that, those are your, comp your competitors. So what you're going to have to try to maximize is the size of the need, the, the resources that you have that are applicable to that need, and not all of your resources will be applicable to every need. Some will and some won't be. We're gonna go through an exercise to see that, and then you'll have different competitors for every need, won't you? Because uh, you, you might your competitor for law will be different for, from your competitors in publishing. So uh, we will look at each of these three things separately. First, let's focus on the customer need. The best place to go, of course, is as we've already said, where are you passionate? Your own backyard. And ask what people want to do that they cannot currently do. Uh, this is the program for later today. I hope you're all planning on attending. I'm the very last speaker this afternoon. But in that talk, I will give more detail about how to find unaddressed customer needs in areas that you are passionate about. I'm gonna skip over that right now, but I will be saying more about that this afternoon. Uh, but let me say this, there are, we are surrounded by thousands of needs all the time. 
Think of an area that you're passionate about, like law or publishing. Well, there are lots of uh, needs that surround it, making law or publishing easier to use, uh, making it faster to get access to what you need, uh, uh, more intelligent systems for uh, understanding the law, perhaps. And then surrounding any core passion are all of these surrounding needs. So just improving the way things are purchased, evaluated, delivered, installed, maintained, analytics surrounding it. What are, let's say you are interested in publishing, there could be a business around analytics for the publishing industry. What are the most popular books and titles and uh, for which demographic segments? That could be a very good business. So the need that you address may be core to your passion or it may be surrounding your passion, okay? Consider both. Okay, here are five examples of customer needs uh, that just chosen at random. And it's important when you think of the need, also think of who is the customer set to whom that need applies. So graffiti proof paint might be cities and humans, cities and humid climate. Slip proof crutches might be athletes and so forth, okay? We're gonna grow this list of customer needs uh, using a variety of different techniques and then we're going to select which one is the best fit for our advantages. Okay, so right now in an area you're passionate about, what is the need and who is the customer? Would anyone be willing to volunteer a unaddressed customer need in an area they're passionate about? Yes, sir. Um, I think in one um, wide scale customer group, uh, small businesses and young businesses have need for professional financial and management advice. Yes. Okay. So what would they need? They would need uh, maybe young or small firms or individuals who have those knowledges, have, have, have the experience, yes. but are not organized in the, in the huge consulting firms. So what would you need is some way of uh, them interacting. So people have a few more hours to work on some other cases to help them develop their business, expand their business for a small fee or a tip or something like that. Beautiful, beautiful. So you've articulated not just the need, but also part of the solution. The need in this case, as I understand it, is um, uh, small businesses that cannot afford to pay the financial and accounting advisory services of the big accounting firms. Especially Great. For, for people who don't come from economics, but are rather just the normal people who have passion and, and perseverance about some particular business. Yes, they yes. They love to do something, they know to do something. Yes. You need some analytical... Plumbers, advice. hairdressers, electricians, yeah. all of those businesses. Company, yes, absolutely. They yep. management advice. I love that. Good, good specific need. Thank you for that. Okay. Now, whatever your need is, I want you to think big. Supersize it. This is a Big Mac, okay? So uh, there are two ways to supersize your need. Uh, you can broaden the need or enlarge the customer set. So let's say your initial customer set were those small businesses here in Belgrade. Well, I would rather say small businesses around the country. Okay, that would be the next step. That or would be one, one step larger. Language, yes, okay. So so you can envision steps to make it bigger and bigger. First just the city, then the region, then the entire country, then the entire former Yugoslavia, yes, then all of Europe, and then all of the United States, just for that need. Or you could say, okay, I'm gonna focus on just this region, but expand the need. So first will be financial services, and then maybe financial and accounting services, and then financial and accounting and management consulting services, and then maybe inventory control services, and then you, so you can do it that way, or both in, at, at the same time. Or software analytics or something. Yeah, yep, great. User friendly. So uh, this is a helpful exercise to help you start thinking big from the very outset. You will not address this big need at the beginning. You need to stay focused. The size of the need has to fit your advantages and resources, but it's good to know, have an idea where you're going. And where you're going will constantly be changing, that's okay. At any point in time, you have an idea of where, which direction you wanna head in. So for example, 
here are some uh, customer sets, and, and these are uh, upsizing them. Oops, they're not showing up. Oh, there they are. So uh, here are the customer sets getting bigger and smaller, and, and the needs getting bigger and smaller. Uh, smaller is just making them more specific, and customer needs making them uh, uh, larger is making them more general. Uh, you may start out with one that's too big, and so you will need to downsize it. That's why we do one level down as well as three or four levels up, okay? All right, so uh, we've already talked about upsizing a customer need, so there we have it. Okay, now, so we've talked about customer need, and again, I will say more about some easy ways to identify customer needs in areas you're passionate about later today. Uh, let's talk about your resources. Uh, which is the first part of your advantages. So there are like seven different types of resources that you have. And the key point here is we have many more resources for starting a business than we tend to realize. Skills, technologies, assets, achievements, relationships, reputation, and strengths. It spells the word stars with two A's and two R's, okay? So what I, uh, you're going to see that again on this next slide. What I'd, what I'd like you to do, we, we don't have time to do it right now, but separately make it a chart like this that lists those seven stars at the top of each column. And then under each column, list as many as you can think of that you bring to bear. So under skills, I have a chemistry, uh, someone might have a chemistry to be, degree, I have work experience, I have a scuba certification. It's okay if they are all a mix and match and don't necessarily relate to each other because you don't know yet which one you're going to choose. Maybe scuba certification will be important. Uh, technologies, what are the technologies I know something about, either as a user or maybe I've studied? My assets, financial assets, physical assets, and knowledge. Everybody here has an intimate knowledge of Belgrade, right? Every, every single person in this room knows a lot more about Belgrade than I, have, I do. I, I've been here once before. I was here in 1978. Was that before you were born? I'll bet it was. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, anyway, it's, and it, it's fabulous how Belgrade has blossomed since 1978. But anyway, so, so that's an asset that you have. Put that on the list. You know, if you were born and raised here, you know it well. Then your accomplishments. I'll tell you why to put these down in just a moment. Then your relationships, people can help you. Uh, your reputation, people who trust you. And your strengths, as in inner strengths, courage, integrity, uh, in, uh, innovation, uh, creativity, and so forth. OK, now these different ones serve different purposes. These two columns here, skills and technologies, are the most important ones for differentiating between different customer needs. So, uh, those will generally be specific to customer needs. Also the knowledge base assets, whereas these financial and physical assets tend to apply more equally to any startup. If you have $1,000 that you can invest in a new ve venture, well, that's $1,000 that you can adjust, adju invest regardless of what the need is, right? So those tend to be less specific. Uh, and then these here, are important for building your confidence. Uh, and it's, there are, you'll come up against lots of obstacles like the ones I was talking about before. So it's important to be very deliberate about building your confidence. And I'll say much more about that because your mind is one of your key assets. Uh, it's really helpful to have a co-founder. Uh, this gentleman here is Dickie Singh. He was effectively my co-founder in my last business, Customer Sat. Uh, he is an expert at software development. Uh, he quickly took over software development, tech support, web operations, quality assurance, and information technology. Those five areas he became responsible for, offloading all of those from me so that I could focus on sales, marketing, products, customers, things that I'm more interested in. And so we made a very complimentary team. So when you're, fill, when you're creating that big table, if you have a co-founder, intermix freely your resources with those of your co-founder, and your list will become a lot longer. Uh, incidentally, what do you look for in a co-founder? 
I would suggest four things. One is someone whose skills are complementary to yours. Two is somebody you trust. Three is somebody who has a work ethic that you respect and comparable to yours. And four, somebody whose vision for the company is broadly aligned with yours. It doesn't have to be exactly aligned because both of your visions will evolve over time. But if you, from the outset, are thinking of taking the company in two different directions, that's probably not going to work. Okay? So, the value of a co-founder. Incidentally, funding is one of your key resources, if, you, if and when you have it. And the one thing I want to say here is a lot of companies I see and talk to try to raise money before they're ready. And they waste a lot of time trying to raise money before they have anything really to show uh, a potential investor that would get them excited. So uh, it's much better to hold off until you have something really significant to show a potential investor. And then the deal will come together more quickly. You'll spend less time raising money. And uh, you will make a more positive first impression. So there are a finite number of times in a company's history, in my view, to raise money. And they are whenever you reach a milestone that significantly reduces investor risk. So if you have positive cash flow, that eliminates the risk that you can have revenue. If you have revenue, that eliminates the risk that you have, can get customers. If you have customers, that eliminates the risk that you, uh, your prototype works. And if your prototype works, that eliminates the risk that you have a valid idea. So uh, you can see how uh, you, you, the value of the company will be greatest right after you achieve one of these milestones that significantly reduces investor risk. Yes? Uh, well, I just want, want you to, to uh, address an important problem here in Serbia that uh, it's quite different um, entrepreneurial uh, surrounding here than in the United States. Here you don't have many uh, angel investors, personal investors. Uh, yes. On one hand, on the other hand, uh, credit is really, really expensive because of a high country risk. Yes. So therefore, when small entrepreneurs try to develop their business, what they usually turn to is either their assets, if they have them, yes. or usually if they don't, family. Yes. And that addresses other issues. So how do you <coughs> combine professional business uh, idea and uh, uh, your, your readiness to be strictly business oriented with uh, family and personal relations that brings it to your business? So those are the, the real problems that yes, you yes, in yes. Serbia have to address. Well, listen, it's, pr it's the same in the U.S., maybe not as severe. But the fact is most companies, even in the U.S., are started without outside capital, either the capital of the entrepreneur or friends and family of the entrepreneur. I, the, my first company, I... Uh, My second company, <laughs> it, it, my first company is a little complicated, so I don't quite know how to explain that one. But my second company, we started with a very small uh, investment, like $40,000. And then that was enough to start business and then start generating revenue. And then we used the revenue that we generated to uh, build our software platform. And then that software platform gave us more that we could offer people, and that let us generate more revenue. And, and so we just kept building the business that way. And so the second company had a million dollars in revenue before we raised money. Yes, but uh, $40,000, as you said, it's a small investment in the United States. Yeah. And it's less than the average pay throughout the year. Yeah. However, here in Serbia, well, you would need 10 years of work well, I, to get $40,000. And computer I, is the same price. I, 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 so that was a company that sold, uh, provided software services to large corporations. Uh, enterprise feedback management is the name of the field. So uh, 
still, the amount of revenue that we were able to generate on a fairly small, the amount of revenue was like 20 times the amount of, of capital we invested. Okay, just scale it down by a factor of 10. So, so maybe with an investment of 4,000, you could achieve revenues of 100,000. Yes, that, that's more realistic about okay. the Serbian experience. Listen, and that's okay. That's, that's okay. You, you're, the size of your scope uh, has to fit your resources. And, and every company, every single company, no matter how large, starts with a tiny seed. General Motors, IBM, General Electric, you name it. Uh, they too had to start small, just like all of us have to start small. And I don't think there's any fundamental difference between starting a high-tech company versus a low-tech company. High-tech companies tend to be more scalable. That's a good thing. But even if you're a low-tech company, uh, you want to be as scalable as possible. And, and later, in just a moment, I'll tell you some ideas for making your small business low-tech more scalable and more high-tech. So um, mo here, most of the resources you have to work with are not money. Money is one item in the third column, financial savings, okay? Look at all the other assets that you have to work with. Your skills, the technologies that you know about, your physical assets, your knowledge-based assets, your accomplishments, all of these things that build your self-confidence, your drive, your initiative, these are the most important assets. These are more important than, than capital. Capital will become more important uh, later on. Okay. Um, your mind is a really important asset. Maybe your most important asset. Now the mind is like an iceberg. Uh, the iceberg is about 80% above water and 20, eight, uh, underwater and 20% above water, right? Your mind is, is the same way. We're only consciously aware of about 20% of the messages that come into our minds. And 80% of the messages that we get just come in without us even being aware of it. Conversations, uh, things that we see. Uh, and so it's really important to protect the mind from any of these uh, messages that come in without our knowing it that could be harmful. The most harmful messages are the ones that we tell ourselves. Negative thoughts like these uh, are, if we repeat them again and again or say them about ourselves, they will become reality, even if there's no substance to them what all, at all. So one of the rules of entrepreneurship is never say anything negative about yourself. If a negative thought is beginning to creep into your mind, for example, of I'm ill at ease socially. Think of a specific moment where you did just the opposite. You put everyone at ease. Doesn't matter how small that moment was. Just think of that instead. If, if it was a, a game, a sports game, you were the star of the game. Everyone here has been a star at some point. Just think about that. Write these down these moments so that you can hand easily get access to them and let those be the unconscious messages that flow into your unconscious mind and then they will help this this process will help those become real strengths of yours okay so uh, also every time we succeed or fail we benefit because we learn something so let's say that that blue circle represents what I know I can do. And then I try something new. Great, I've, and I'm successful. I've learned something new. See how the blue is expanding. Now I try something beyond the blue and I fail, the red area. Okay, well I've learned that with the resources that I had when I tried to do that, I could not be successful. That's useful knowledge. So I, if I want to try it again, I either have to scale back what I'm attempting to do or I need slightly more resources, perhaps. Okay, I try again in a different direction down here and I fail. Again, I got more useful knowledge. And then I scale back that goal 
and I'm successful this time, great. We've expanded what we know we can do from the small blue area to the bigger blue area down there. We've, and there are two benefits. One, we expand what we know we can do and we can better judge how much can be achieved with a, a certain set of resources. So this will, at some point in your life, serve you well because you'll be able to be a better investor, because you'll be able to judge how better, how much can be achieved by another entrepreneur with a given set of resources. When we criticize and complain about anything, endorphins flow into our brains, and for all of five seconds, we feel a sense of well-being and superiority. But after the five seconds, the endorphins fade away, and we lose that sense of well-being and superiority, but everybody around us who we've criticized has been demoralized. So the outcome of this can only be negative. So strike criticizing and complaining from your repertoire. The longer I'm around, the longer I'm in business, the more I realize they, they are not useful tools. Instead, uh, use other tools. Ask questions. Uh, uh, articulate the consequences. If we do this, I believe this will happen. Uh, celebrate the good. When you see something good, no matter how small, acknowledge it, celebrate it, and you will help build that good in the other person. When I was in my mid-30s, I accepted the fact that I'm gay. Most people wouldn't view that as a strength. I disagree. For me, I think it has been a very significant strength in at least three ways. One, uh, it wasn't socially acceptable to be gay when I was growing up. And so the energy that I might have put into dating, I put into other things like sports and career and, and uh, school. And as a result, uh, all these years later, I'm very much enjoying the, the benefit of that early investment. Two, uh, I'm not a minority in any sense that I can think of other than being gay. Uh, and so this has sensitized me to what it's like to be a minority. Uh, three, when you're growing up uh, and uh, you, uh, you people, people make assumptions that guys are attracted to gals and vice versa. People just naturally assume that. But you know, growing up, that that assumption, which is almost universally made, is not universally correct you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not correct because it doesn't apply to you. So I think being gay has helped me think outside of the box and not necessarily accept the status quo. So it has genuinely been an asset for me. Similarly, if you can think of some aspect of yourself that you cannot change, you genuinely cannot change it, try to think of a way to view it as a strength. Please set the bar very high. Don't use this to accept some aspect of yourself that you can change, but that you would prefer not to change or you don't want to uh, hassle or burden yourself with changing it. But if you genuinely cannot change it, if you can find a way to view that aspect of yourself as a strength, it will become one of your strengths, okay? So, just as it's beneficial to not say negative things about you and to look for the good in you, so is it good to look for the good in others. And by doing so, you will elevate yourself to a position of leadership to those around you. Even if you see just a glimmer of courage or perseverance or good judgment in someone else, let them know that you see it, acknowledge it. And that will draw good people to you and elevate you to leadership. How many people here use PowerPoint? Okay, pretty much all of us, right? Well, here's a PowerPoint tip. Put a picture of a cat, a kitten, or a puppy in the slide, and you will make it more engaging, as I've done here. Well, uh, this is not about the kitten or the cat. Uh, this is about that spot on the carpet right there above the cat, which everyone can see. Okay, well, 
If I am trying to lift up the carpet at that point, I can't lift it up very high, can I? Unless I lift up all the other points around the carpet, right? So we're all like the points on that carpet. I cannot lift myself up very high unless I lift up all the surrounding points. Okay, so we've talked a great deal about your resources, including your mind as one of your key resources that you have to apply in starting a business and preserving it, protecting it, enhancing it. Uh, now let's talk about customer needs, additional customer needs that are suggested by your resources. So one of the wonderful things about having this chart is you can stand back and look at it and it will suggest additional customer needs beyond the ones that we've already thought of. So here I see chemistry and work experience and so forth. That suggests, uh, and since I know conversational Spanish, automatic English-Spanish translation between the patient and the doctor. Or same-day home delivery of prescription drugs because I know my hometown and I know something about uh, pharmaceuticals. So we'll add those two uh, additional needs to our list of needs that we came up with earlier. But we're, do we're not done yet. One of the other things we can do is combine the technologies that we know something about to find new combinations of technologies. Those new combinations will also suggest additional needs. If you know of two technologies, and here's a whole bunch of them listed there, the intersection uh, may be small, but it'll be growing faster than either technology. If you can meaningfully combine three technologies, the intersection will be even smaller uh, and it'll grow even faster. So uh, to show you an example of this, let's say you know six technologies, the one six listed here. Well, you know how many pairwise combinations of six items there are, or n items in general? There are uh, n times n minus one over two. So uh, in this case, six times six minus one over two is 15 different combinations. So of those six different things, very deliberately, uh, make a list of all 15 combinations. Here they are. And then scan that list and look for a new combination that might not have been applied yet. Bingo, you have a solution that might address a new customer need. So here are those 15 combinations. Don't worry about reading all this. It's just that uh, this is sort of a worksheet where someone has listed the 15 combinations and then tried to think of, of uh, uh, how they might be used. And sure enough, two of them uh, stand out. If we were to combine three or more of these, maybe we'd find yet another one. So uh, that would be two plus one additional ones, and uh, those are three more customer needs that we're adding to our list, okay? So now we've come up with 10 customer needs uh, uh, that are, are good possible fits for us. Okay, next step is to focus on competitors' resources. So first of all, who is a competitor and who is not? So are phone and texting competitors? Any, anyone have thoughts on that? So here's phone and here's text. Yes, sir. Hardly. What's that? Hardly. Hardly, okay. So mostly they're not, but maybe in some small part of there is some overlap. Uh, where, where would be the overlap? Communication. Communication, yes. So some phone calls, you might send a text message instead. What, what would be some of those phone calls? A, a very brief one? Yes, short? One directional. One directional. I'll be there at 2 o'clock. Um, uh, I'm here. Uh, anyway, so the, the answer is, they are competitors to the extent they satisfy the same need. So if you need to convey a short piece of information, you could do so either by phone or text. And, and for that uh, need, they are competitors. For a very extended conversation that's interactive, probably not. So, so that's how you decide whether uh, somebody is a competitor or not, whether or not they address the same need. And, and uh, the good news is that if we entrepreneurs can come up with new ways of addressing challenges, uh, we often go unchallenged by the existing 
uh, companies. So mainframes took over, uh, were taken over by mini computers, minis were taken over by PCs, PCs by laptops, and uh, in every case, uh, <clears throat> they were often overlooked until they became a really serious threat. So that's good news for us entrepreneurs. <coughs> Everyone here is familiar with HP, Dell, and IBM. They all make laptops that run Windows. Uh, and they're all better than the other in some fashion. So one of those three vendors might be faster, 20% faster, or 20% cheaper, or 30% stronger than the other. Okay. But Apple, on the other hand, is different. It uh, doesn't rely on Microsoft Windows. It developed its own operating system. They tightly integrated the hardware and the software. They, uh, the, the platform, uh, the, the uh, Apple uh, machines were better for different things than were Windows early on, either for video or for graphics or for music. And uh, as a result of being different rather than better, Apple has steadily gained market share on Microsoft Windows and last year or the year before became the most valuable company in the world. So similarly, uh, given a choice between being better or different, it's good to be different. Here's another way of looking at it. Here are Dell, HP, and IBM all on a plane, and here's Apple on a completely different plane. Much harder to compete against than simply being better. Being better is a tenuous competitive position because your competitors will want to outdo you, and so you'll have to compete with entrenched competitors. But if you're different, solving a problem differently using different technology or different design or different approach, then you will be less of a threat to them. They'll be less likely to come after you, and you'll have more time to establish a foothold and grow. So different is better than better. Okay, so now we have on the left-hand side all of those customer needs we came up with and all of our resources, and now we want to do an alignment between the two. For each of those customer needs, circle the resources that I can apply to address that customer need, and look for the need for which the most resources are circled. Maybe use different colors, the ones I apply and the ones that truly make me different from who is else is out there. And uh, here's another way to do it. Here are all the customer needs, the 10 needs down the vertical axis, and here are my skills and technologies on the horizontal axis. And make a chart like this that shows to what extent do I apply each of my resources for, or my advantages for each of those customer needs. And then also add a column, how passionate am I about this particular customer need? So this gives you a very useful tool to look at and think about which of these customer needs I'm best suited for addressing. The ones with the most checks will use my skills and technologies the most, combined with the ones that I'm most passionate about. And some of those will uh, naturally uh, be stronger than others. So here I'm circling the ones that I'm strong on and uh, writing out the ones that don't look as good. So this is how you narrow down the list of all the customer needs to see uh, which ones you're most likely to be successful addressing. Okay. So right now, what is one advantage you have for a customer need? Could someone who hasn't spoken yet share one advantage they have? Could be something very small, like an intimate knowledge of Belgrade. Does somebody know where all of the McDonald's are in Belgrade? How many, Bel how many McDonald's do we have in Belgrade? Probably, sure. probably a dozen, okay. Eight, okay, well that's impressive. This gentleman knows exactly how many McDonald's restaurants there are in Belgrade. And do you know where all eight are? I think so, no. That could be helpful for something, right? Yes, for home delivery of 
home yeah. delivery, or let's say you're providing uh, a delivery to McDonald's of some supplies, then if you know exactly where those eight are, uh, that's good information. You don't have to learn. Maybe you can figure out how to optimize the route between the eight, or among the eight, so you can deliver supplies most eff effectively, or deliver hamburgers most effectively in the other direction. So, so that, that's an example of an advantage around which you might start your business. It doesn't have to be huge. It could be something small. Okay. Okay. So we want to maximize customer need and advantage. So here's a way I think about that. And pardon me for using a San Francisco-centric uh, example here because I live in San Francisco. Oops. Uh oh Oh, gosh. Come back. Um, so, so, what's that? Being different. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, I'm, I live in San Francisco. Let's say I want to uh, do a business, uh, I, and I live specifically in South of Market, which is part of San Francisco. Okay, so I could target just South of Market, which I know intimately. I know a lot of people. If I was selling something there, they would know me, they would trust me. I'd have a big advantage there. So my advantage in South of Market is big, right? It's wide. But the market is very small, narrow. Okay, now as I expand my market to all of San Francisco, to California, to USA, and worldwide, the market is constantly growing. But my advantage is getting smaller and smaller because outside of South of Market or San Francisco, they don't know me. They don't trust me. Why should they buy from me rather than someone else? And let's say my competitors are in Los Angeles, San Diego, or Sacramento. Once I expand beyond San Francisco, I'm into their territory rather than my territory and so forth so it gets smaller and smaller. Similarly, so, so what I'm looking for is kind of what is the optimal here? And you can see if I take the customer need times the advantage, and this is subjective, but that's okay, it opt, it's, it's largest at a certain point. And in this case, it's largest at San Francisco. So that's what I'm seeking. Uh, look for where does the customer need grow most rapidly. Maybe it grows very rapidly from south of market to San Francisco. And where does the advantage fall off most rapidly? And maybe it, it, it falls off most rapidly after I expand beyond San Francisco. So considering such factors, try to decide what is the optimal size of need I should address initially. Okay. Now let me say a bit about growing beyond that initial need, and that is be making your business more scalable. These are two businesses here. Uh, the red business is less scalable than the green business. And what do I mean by scalable? How much additional revenue or profit I can generate for each additional dollar of capital invested. Okay? In the green company, for each one, each uh, additional dollar or euro or whatever I invest, the, the revenue or profit grows exponentially or geometrically. But in the red company, it grows linearly, not as fast. Probably the red company is more labor intensive than the green company, okay? So any company can be made more scalable. Let's see if I have a slide on this. No, I don't. Um, but so let me just tell you some of the ways that they can be more scalable. If, they're, if you can get your customers to do things themselves, rather than having your staff do it, that's a more scalable approach. So let's say one approach is to have salespeople configure your complex product. That's expensive to have salespeople doing that. Instead, is there a way that customers can go to your website and fill out a form and configure the product themselves? How many uh, features, what colors, and so forth? If so, that will reduce how much time your salespeople have to spend doing that. If you can take credit cards rather than have to worry about purchase orders and invoices, you can substantially eliminate all of that accounting overhead. That makes your business more scalable. 
Uh, if instead of selling a product one time, if you can sell it as a recurring subscription that renews automatically every year, that is a more scalable approach because you don't have to use up precious salesperson's time and resources to uh, uh, renew the subscription. Only if they cancel it do you need to get involved. And customer service and support tends to be a labor-intensive function. What if you can create an online community so that you reward and incentivize your customers for supporting each other? Uh, that is a more scalable approach than having to hire a lot of people to do uh, customer service and support. So any business can be made more scalable. Here, here's, here's a way a plumber or a, an electrician can do it. Uh, rather than having to have a secretary uh, keep track of my schedule, what if I can go online or what if I can have a simple online tool that will let my customers schedule their own appointments? That makes me, the uh, plumber or the electrician, more scalable. So even trades, traditional trades, can become more scalable using technology. And tools that do this online scheduling are available free of charge online now. Okay, after that it's a question of repeating, experimenting, uh, evolving. Uh, what, what you ultimately come up with may be very different from what you started with. That's okay. That's to be expected. That happens. Uh, it is an iterative process. So uh, I'm going to skip this because we're running out of time, but uh, think about the optimal size. Finally, I want to talk about is entrepreneurship ethical? A lot of people talk about uh, business uh, and business ethics, and usually what you hear is things like predation and theft, and uh, uh, that's bad. And philanthropy is good in business. So helping the poor in uh, Africa or helping hurricane victims, that's good. Well, I don't disagree with either of those uh, good or bad items, but I don't think that's the whole story, and I don't even think it's the most important part of the story. I think the most important part is how entrepreneurship is good in and unto itself even without uh, corporate philanthropy. So let me say a word about that. Here are all of the stages of the entrepreneurial process, many of which we've already talked about. Finding an idea, striking out on your own, testing and re refining an idea, and so forth. So let's first focus on the individual virtues and values that are required to do that successfully. Well, you have to be diligent, creative, rational. You have to, it takes courage to strike out on your own. I didn't mention it, but uh, my first company I started uh, with a really cool technology for which there was no customer need. And it took me six months to abandon that idea finally in favor of something for which there was a real customer need. So, so it takes intellectual honesty to, uh, be, to do this well. And you have to treat your employees, customers, suppliers, and investors fairly because you're brand new. They don't need to deal with you. They can deal with somebody who's better established. Uh, and, and that may take creativity because you don't have much in the way of resources yet. So those are individual virtues and values. Let's now consider the social benefits. Well, by having entrepreneurs um, create new products and services and address customer needs that aren't currently being addressed, you are offering more choice, more innovation, or lower cost. Uh, you have to create win-wins among all of these stakeholders or else you're not going to be able to uh, be successful. So if you stand back and look at all of the entrepreneurs across the world, they, millions of them, they are innovating, creating win-wins, uh, creating employment, creating jobs, and all of these are, in aggregate, are improving the quality of life and driving economic growth. And incidentally, guess where most of the money that funds philanthropy comes from? 
entrepreneurship. So given all of those factors, I rest my case that entrepreneurship is the most ethical thing you can do for all of these reasons that we haven't talked much about. Well, uh, we've talked about needs for starting a company, for uh, uh, advantage.